everyone. Welcome to Geek Thyself, a podcast by a nerd for other nerds that really love geeking out over different facts and esoteric information and trivia. My name is Heather, and I'll be your host as we journey into the wondrous land of information. Welcome to this week's episode of Geek Thyself. This is actually the very first episode of Geek Thyself. And so I plan to start off by giving you just a little bit more information about exactly who I am, as well as what Geek Thyself is about. My name again is Heather. I'll be your host. And you may have come here from some of our other Nerdsmith projects. If that's the case, then hi and welcome to my podcast. Some of the other Nerdsmith projects I'm mentioning include things like Shenanigans, 20-Sided DM, and Married to the DM, just to name a few of them. I personally am only involved in shenanigans, so some of you may have heard of me there. I'm from California. I've lived here all my life, uh, no plans to move anywhere else, and I am a huge animal lover. I've been working as a veterinary technician at a cat-only vet hospital for the last 12 years. Yes, I am that crazy cat lady, and I'm proud of it, so if that's a problem for you, you may want to switch to a different podcast. Especially since anyone who knows cats knows that I'm probably going to at some point or another have one of them yelling at me in the background. Depending on how well I can edit it out, you may hear it anyway. I've also been involved in role-playing games and board gaming since about 15 years ago, really, is when I started. Before that, even, I've always been interested in anything that was sci-fi, fantasy, so things like Star Trek, Star Wars, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings... All of those sort of things fall into my wheelhouse, and I just love it all. Now, Geek Thyself is going to be a podcast specifically delving into more information about different subjects. It's exactly what it sounds like. I'm basically going to be trying to condense several hours worth of research into roughly a 20 to 30 minute podcast for you all to listen to. And it's geared strictly towards people who just really like getting all of that random information, some, you know, random topic, something you may not have even necessarily thought to look into yourself, something as simple as, I wonder where that particular slang term came from, all the way up to, I don't understand why I have blue eyes when my parents both have brown. Can you explain the genetics of that? Anything like that is something that I'm willing to address, so there's a very large gamut. But if you have any suggestions or any topic ideas for future podcasts, please feel free to hit me up on Twitter at amethyst underscore magic, and that's magic with a CK. Now, today's subject is going to be something very near and dear to my heart as a gamer, and that is the history of dice. The earliest known versions of dice, or at least the earliest suspected, I should say, are from over 8,000 years ago, and they're probably things that people just found along the way. So things like pebbles or seashells, dried fruit pits, anything that could be flipped or rolled and show up a different side, giving the person a different outcome. The very first versions of dice that are actually associated as being the precursors to dice are actually called knuckle bones, or the Greek called them astragali. Now, knuckle bones are literally bones, and they are the ankle bones of any sort of hooved animal. The reason they were probably used is because they are easy to find from any sort of culture that would have hooved animals around. There are two curved sides, which the it can't really land on very well, and four flat sides, which leaves the person with four potential outcomes when they roll the knuckle bones. These knuckle bones were probably used initially in different forms of divination. So that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, huge, overarching, world-changing questions, but it could have been something like, what kind of crop do we plant this year? Or should I marry person A or person B? Do we hunt to the right or to the left today? Those are the kinds of things that ancient peoples may have thrown the knuckle bones for. And then their shaman or medicine man, whatever their term or version of a holy person was, could interpret the information that came back on those knuckle bones. Now, the reason that it would have been some form of holy man or woman doing this interpretation is because back then... Thousands and thousands of years ago, people didn't really have a concept of probability and statistics. 
if you told them when you roll that, you're going to get one of four answers and it's going to be roughly a quarter of the time, that's not something that necessarily would have computed for them. They wouldn't have understand the mathematics behind the probability of a one in four chance. However, they did understand some form of over overarching power and deity. So they would have often interpreted the outcome on these knuckle bones as some sort of information from their gods telling them what to do. The gods have told me I should hunt to the left. The gods have told me I should not marry Ugg, or whatever their names were back then. Who knows? Some of the oldest known dice that we would actually recognize as being fairly similar to modern dice are from two different spots. One is six-sided dice that were found in Egyptian tombs from about 2000 BC. So those would have been very similar to the standard cube-shaped die that we're all used to seeing. You know, the white one that has the little black dots on it. The other die that was found from very long ago is from Sumer Mesopotamian area. And it was a four-sided pyramidal dice. So a three-sided pyramid. And those are actually from as far back as 3000 BC, and they're thought to be related to the royal game of Ur, which, for anyone who doesn't know, is actually the earliest board game that we have the rules for. We actually have the rules and we have some ancient game pieces from this particular game. So somewhere out there, there's actually people who know how to play a game from 3000 BC, and it involves dice. One of the really interesting things that I discovered when I was going into my research for this particular episode of the podcast, dice didn't develop as a concept in just one spot. Different cultures across the world all developed the idea of some type of dice on their own. Now, it varied a little, obviously, probably from place to place, and some of that information is lost because this developed so long ago that it was actually before written history, meaning we don't have a written record of exactly how they used them or exactly how they interpreted them. We might have some old drawings and we have the actual knuckle bones or initial versions of dice themselves, but we don't necessarily have a lot of information on exactly how they interpreted it or how they used them. Still, the fact that Thousands of years ago, across the world, multiple cultures all came up with some form of dice, something you could roll or throw that would come up with a different outcome to help you answer questions or to play games with. That's a really cool idea that it's it's such a basic universal concept that pretty much the entire world came up with it on their own. Now, there's probably some areas where before they could develop it on their own, it, you know, traveled over from a different section but still, thousands of years ago, completely separately, no way to contact each other, you know, no email and cell phones, they thought up this idea separately, on their own, came up with it, and eventually it became known across the world. It's likely that dice have also influenced some of our other gaming pieces that everyone is pretty familiar with. Now, the dominoes that most people are familiar with are based off of dominoes that first started showing up in Italy and France around the 18th century. But the very first evidence of dominoes is actually from China in the 12th century. And it's thought that their development was probably heavily influenced by dice. They don't have any 100% concrete evidence of this. However, I thought it was really interesting. And in some ways, it makes a lot of sense. Dice were everywhere even before dominoes were first mentioned in the 12th century. And dominoes, to a certain extent, are pretty similar to dice. There's different numbers. Now, we don't roll them in everything the same way anymore, obviously. But in some ways, a domino just kind of looks like a flattened die, complete with the white base and the little black dots. Speaking of the 12th century, one of the... Interesting things that I found out also while doing my research is that we actually have a dice game around now, here in 2018, that originates from back in medieval France and Europe. Now, back then, the game was called Hazard. There were rules that are more complicated than today's game, and it spread across Europe and actually eventually ended up coming over here to the Americas. Specifically, it was brought to French colonial New Orleans in Louisiana. It 
was there by the French and French colonists called crapaud. And I apologize, I do not speak French, so my accent and the way I'm pronouncing it is probably not 100% right, but it is spelled C-R-A-P-A-U-D. Now, crapaud was very, very popular in French colonial New Orleans, and it spread across the area, and eventually they started to simplify the rules to make it easier for everyone to play. And over time, it became known as craps, which... That, I'm sure, is a game everyone's more familiar with. Craps is a game that is popular primarily in gambling areas, given the nature of the game. So it would be popular in places like Vegas, Reno, Atlantic City. Anywhere, really, that they have organized gambling is somewhere that you can see craps. And it's, again, based off of a medieval dice game. A dice game that was actually so popular in medieval Europe at the time that Chaucer mentioned dice in the Canterbury Tales, saying they dance and play at dice both day and night. One of the cool things I found out about Hazard is that it wasn't just played by the aristocracy. It wasn't just played by the people who had a lot of money. It was actually played across the board by the commoners and aristocrats alike. One of the suspicions of why it was so popular is because dice are not that expensive to make, especially back then. All you had to do was have some stone, bone, wood, something you could carve into the shape of a cube, and you could make your own dice and play a game as long as you knew the rules, making it very easily accessible for people both in the lower income areas and in the higher income areas. Obviously, the higher income people probably had much fancier dice, but if you're playing a game with your friends, that's the more important part. So whether the dice were made out of wood or out of marble, everyone was having fun. Some of the more modern iterations of popular dice games started coming about in the early 19th, well, in the early 1900s. So one of those games being Monopoly which I'm sure is a game that everyone listening is at least semi-familiar with, even if it's not your favorite. I know I've heard Monopoly can, you know, break families, and it's been banned by some families because it's so competitive. And honestly, having played the game a few times myself, I could see that being an issue, depending on competitiveness in the family. Early on, it was developed as an anti-Monopoly game, and over time, it transformed slightly into the game we now know today. At the time, back in the early 1930s, it was a very popular board game, especially once the Parker Brothers took it on from the original creators and turned it into what we know. Now, that what that means is that even though dice already were a known thing, it changed some of the way people interpreted dice from just being sort of for gambling to being a day-to-day game item. So dice started to make their way into the home and become part of everyday life, similar to how they would have been in ancient times, but with a very different reason behind their purpose. Up until now, I've primarily been talking about the regular six-sided die that everyone is so familiar with, the one that has usually white material for the more common ones, and then you know, the little black dots on them on the various sides, which are actually called pips for anyone who doesn't know. Something I found out while I was doing my research. Now, these pips are actually also set up so that the numbers on the opposite sides always equal seven. If you look at one of the dice you have in your house, you can actually see the one and the six will be on the opposite side, the three and the four. Now, that really only applies, though, to the regular six-sided die that most people are familiar with. Starting back in the 1960s and 70s, some of the other shapes of die became more commonly known because role-playing games or RPGs started to become more popular and more well-known. Obviously, they still weren't necessarily commonplace. People may have known about them, but it wasn't something everybody did. Nonetheless, starting there and then moving forward into the late 70s and early 80s when Dungeons & Dragons came about, and honestly, Dungeons & Dragons is the one most people recognize as being a role-playing game. Not surprising considering of how popular it is, and now in recent years it's had a resurgence again of popularity. For those types of games, the majority of the RPG games that are out there use 
a version of a dice system that often gets referred to as the D20 system. What the D20 system refers to is that the largest die used in the game is a D20, a 20-sided die. The other five most commonly used die shapes for this particular type of role-playing game are a four-sided die, a six-sided die, an eight-sided die, a 10-sided die, and a 12-sided die. They're commonly referred to as D4, D6, D8, D10, D12, and D20 by most gamers out there. It's a shorter way to say it, and it's just sort of the lingo that gets thrown around. If you have gamer friends, you may have even heard them using some of these terms just goofing off with each other. Oh, you gotta roll a 20 to see if you make it, dude. Things like that. Probably not quite those words, but you get the idea. Now, those aren't the only shapes and numbers of sides that are on dice. Those are the most commonly used ones, and they're very prevalent throughout role-playing games. And for obvious reasons, being a gamer myself, this is actually the area that I was the most interested to find out more information about. There are lots and lots and lots of different shapes, more than I actually even realized. And something that kind of surprised me, but it probably shouldn't have, is that all of these different number of side die actually have a specific name for them. Now, the name and the complications of saying that name vary a lot depending on how many sides the die has. For example, mo a lot of gamers, myself included, know that a 20-sided die is actually called an icosahedron. Not everyone knows that, but there's quite a few of us that do. And a lot of people know that the 12-sided die is called a dodecahedron. Two of the names that I found that I thought were the most interesting, and honestly the hardest to say, were actually for the 50-sided die and for the 120-sided die. The 50-sided die actually has a proper name of Icosakai pentagonal trapezohedron. And I dare you to say that three times fast, because I sure as hell can't. The 120-sided die is a Dystiacus triacontahedron. Now, those are two of the more complicated names. Some of the other names I found are relatively simple. For example, a four-sided die that I mentioned earlier is called a tetrahedron, which is significantly easier to say. And a six-sided die is called a cube. That's right, cube. They came up with a insanely long name, and it's hard to pronounce, like Icosakai pentagonal trapezohedron for a 50-sided die, and cube for six. Go figure. But as far as I can tell, most of these names seem to have some sort of Greek roots, probably because some of the early mathematicians were Greek. So that would be my assumption on why that is. Nonetheless, each one has a different name, and to be perfectly honest, I could run through them all, but it's a lot, and I don't really want to butcher that many words in a row. So if you really want to find out more information about it, you can look them up. Uh, during my research, I actually found, for example, that surprisingly, but not surprisingly, Wikipedia has a list of several of those die shapes and the different names. So that's a good spot if you want to look for a few others. There's also obviously books out there on different types of dice and the history of dice. One particular book, which I actually used, is called The Secret History of Dice from Ancient to Modern Times, written by a man named Donald Tabor, Rodney Miles, and Sherman Morrison. That book had a lot of great information and honestly is a definitely more in-depth look at the history of dice than what I just gave you. A lot more pages, a lot more information, Another fun fact that I found out about dice while I was doing my research and that I really wanted to share and think is really interesting is that they actually predate alphanumerical writing. Dice existed prior to things like one, two, and three numerals existing, and there were no Roman numerals either. Those didn't exist yet. This is why if you look up pictures of these ancient dice that have been found in various places, the, the, you know, the Egyptian tombs, Sumer and Mesopotamian ruins. If you look at those dice, none of them have numbers on them, but they all have dots. They all have pips on them. 
even though those cultures may not have had a concept of a written language that involved numerals the way we know them now, they did understand math and counting enough to put a certain number of dots on those dice. They may have also, in some cultures and in some places, drawn pictures on them instead of just the dots. Specifically, also, probably if they were using them for some kind of divination. Um, there's actually 12-sided dice that are used now for certain types of divination called claromancy, where you use those dice to try to figure out information about what's going to happen with the future. Dice are in some ways associated with superstitions and potentially influenced outcomes even now, specifically related to things like gambling. We've all heard of Lady Luck, and you see it in movies, and I'm sure people do it in real life to a certain extent. They'll have someone blow on the dice for luck or blow them a kiss for luck. Obviously, nowadays, we have mathematics, we have statistics, we understand that there's an equal probability when you roll those dice of what your outcome's going to be. Doesn't mean people don't have superstitions about what's going to work best for them. Even gamers do it. I myself have taken dice out of my bag and set them aside not wanting to use them because they rolled badly for me previously. Realistically, I understand that the statistics and reality doesn't support the fact that that dice has anything wrong with it other than that I happened to roll badly a couple of times and it was just chance, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to set it to the side and give it a time out for a minute. Or, as some of my close friends like to do, actually put that die into dice jail. I even have a friend whose husband made her an actual little wooden dice jail to put her dice into when they roll badly. And honestly, I can't blame her. If you spend hours creating a character that you love and your dice keep failing you and almost killing your character, you know, why not try different dice? It's not going to hurt. So in some ways, dice, which started out in ancient times as a means of divination and gathering information supposedly from the gods, are still considered a somewhat superstitious and mystical item, depending on your interpretation. Well, everyone... Thank you again for tuning in to this week's episode of Geek Thyself. I hope you enjoyed learning more about dice as much as I did. Um, obviously, there's a lot more information out there. The book I mentioned is a great resource. It's available on Amazon for Kindle and in paperback, as well as you can find out a lot of information online. There's different encyclopedias such as Britannica that have information online. As I mentioned, Wikipedia earlier had information on some of the different names for the different dice great places to start and maybe find out more information than even what I was able to give you. If you have any other suggestions or commentary, you can reach out to me at amethyst underscore magic on Twitter, and that's magic with a CK. Otherwise, you can tune in next week for whatever we're going to learn about next. And in the meantime, don't forget to keep learning all of that random and fun information and geek thyself. Hi everyone, this is Heather from Geek Thyself. I'm a huge gamer and nerd, which comes as no surprise to any of you. So I'm really excited to talk about our sponsor today, DiceBard. You can find them at DiceBard.com, and I really recommend you check out the website because they have some amazing stuff. They've got gorgeous dice, really awesome apparel. I mean, they even have a Cthulhu and a Beholder beanie, which is just fantastic, especially if you're a Lovecraftian like me. It's awesome. And on top of that, if you use our special coupon code GEEK, you can now get free expedited shipping. So don't forget to check them out. That's DiceBard.com. Geek Thyself is a proud member of the Nerdsmith Network. So don't forget to check out some of our other content like Shenanigans and Wand Radio at Nerdsmith.org. Hi, you've reached Married to the DM. Tessa and Logan aren't here right now. Please leave your gaming or relationship questions at the sound of the beep and we'll get back to you during our next episode. Till then, the couple that plays together stays together. Beep! Did you just say beep? Yes.